This year for my fall presentation, I decided to get involved with the Kestrel Partnership Program as a citizen scientist. I first heard about this from the Paragon Fund newsletter, and after researching the details online, was eager to get involved. I began by going out to the World Center for Birds of Prey and interviewing Allison Woodard, the Kestrel Partnership Program's coordinator with citizen scientists. Hello, my name is Thomas Seaborn, citizen scientist for the Paragon Fund's American Kestrel Partnership Project. And this is Allison Woodard, Partnerships Program Biologist. Hi. Right. So, Allison, um, why did the Paragon Fund start the pro American Kestrel Partnership Project? What are some of the stated goals? Increase kestrel populations? Learn more about preferred nesting locations? Um, well, kestrel populations have been declining across North America, so particularly folks on the East Coast who used mm -hmm. to see kestrels all over the place. Nowadays, they're actually pretty hard to find. Yeah, so they have data showing this, that their numbers are declining um, in a lot of areas. I mean, on the West Coast and the East Coast are the two areas most hit in places mm -hmm. like Florida and the South. And around Boise, actually, they're doing fine. We think their populations are actually increasing, which yeah. is kind of puzzling. So what we want to do, um, there are some nest box programs around the country that are looking at kestrel population trends, but they tend to be pretty isolated from each other, and they don't really talk. <laughs> which means that uh, there aren't enough of them, first of all, and then when we try to get all their data together to put into a study, um, they use a bunch of different methods, which is difficult to compare. So what our program is doing is we're getting a whole bunch of people, just like yourself, um, to put up nest boxes, and then we'll put all the data in one place, and that way when we want to use it, we can go back, and it should tell us things on why the kestrel populations are declining and how we can help stop the decline. Okay, cool. Since you can communicate with the citizen scientists, what can regular students like me and my classmates do to get involved with help? Right, well, I mean, you're off to a great start. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is put up a nest box or multiple nest mm -hmm. boxes and then monitor them, which is pretty fun because you get to peek in and look at the chicks and the eggs and stuff. And um, I'm sure that you've already read up on all the material, but really what it takes mm -hmm. is um, just building or purchasing your box and finding a good place to put it, and then going back um, about once a week during the spring when they're in the nest box and you just kind of count the eggs and the nestlings and then you can put everything into our website, yes, which actually. we'll have up soon. <laughs> okay, um, the American kestrel is classified as a bird of prey since it demonstrates the following characteristics. Um, a curved beak for ripping prey, um, sharp talons for capturing and or killing its prey, and keen eye to locate its prey. Better shot. <laughs> Awesome. How does a kestrel capture its prey? What constitutes its primary food sources? So kestrels are what's called generalists, which means they eat a whole bunch of different types of foods. So they love insects, first of all, which means you'll see them in lots of fields. Um, they love fields. And mice, they love mice and voles, any small rodents that they can carry. Um, and then they'll also occasionally take things like little snakes or lizards or even frogs. It's really whatever they can catch. And what they do is they'll sit on a perch, which is why you see them lots of times on power lines or sitting on fence posts. And they look, and then when they see something, they swoop down and grab it. Um, and one of the most distinctive things about kestrels that I think is pretty awesome is most raptors can't hover in place. It's a really difficult flight maneuver to pull off. But if there's a light breeze, kestrels can just face into the wind and they'll just hover in place um, over their prey until they see something go by and then they nab it. Okay. And one thing, Mm -hmm. One fact, one more. This is kind of nasty for some people, but I think it's actually really cool. Um, kestrels see into um, the light spectrum, a portion of the light spectrum that we can't. So if you think of a rainbow, you know there's purple. They can see beyond purple into what's called the ultraviolet range. Mm -hmm. And what this helps them with actually is that voliurin shows up in that spectrum. So they can actually see it on the ground. And when they're looking, they'll see little trails of volpine, basically. Mm -hmm. And so when the paths intersect, uh, when they cross each other, they know that that's where the animals are gonna hang out. So they kind of haunt those areas and it helps them to find their prey. I think that's awesome. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Yeah. It's my understanding that kestrels are cavity nesters. Um, could you please, ex 
please explain what that means. Do they use existing cavities or do they create their own? So cavity nesters means basically that you nest in um, the trunk of a tree instead of building a nest on the branches of a tree. And um, they'll find cavities anywhere. I mean, sometimes they'll nest in cliffs, or nowadays they nest under the eaves of houses, really, anywhere they can find. Um, but what, what that helps them with is when you're nesting, you're always trying to keep your your chicks away mm-hmm. from predators. And there are a few ways to do that. One is camouflage, but another is just hiding it. Mm-hmm. So if you're in a cavity, you're hidden. Um, so it's really useful. And uh, normally in the wild, like I said, they use usually tree trunks that have been hollowed out by woodpeckers and such. Um, but if you put up nest boxes, they actually prefer the nest boxes to natural tree cavities. So um, that's why we're encouraging people to put up the boxes. What is a kestrel's typical clutch size? Does it vary? If so, how? It does vary. Um, anywhere from I mean, two to five, and it also depends on how many eggs hatch. So usually kestrels will lay at three to five eggs, although sometimes it goes over, sometimes it's under. Um, and then if they all hatch and fly successfully, then that's how many they raise. The box that we had up here on the hill last year had five chicks, so that's pretty standard. Um, how long does it typically take for the nestlings to fledge? Uh, kestrels will lay their eggs at the beginning of April. Mm-hmm. They typically hatch in Boise. This changes around the country, mm-hmm. but in Boise they usually hatch around the beginning of May. And then almost exactly a month later, so about 30, 31 days, the mm-hmm. fledglings usually leave the nest. How long does it take for the juvenile birds to mature into adults? Um, well, it depends on your definition mm-hmm. of adult. So mm-hmm. as soon as they leave the nest, mm-hmm. they'll learn how to hunt. And they usually stay with their parents for a few weeks, kind mm-hmm. of learning the ropes. Um, and their parents will feed them. It's kind of like someone leaving for college, but mm-hmm. your parents still help you out with the rent and stuff like that. Um, and then once they leave for migration, though, at the end of the summer, they're totally independent. Mm-hmm. But kestrels won't start breeding um, until they get their what's called adult plumage, Mm -hmm. so they'll lose their baby feathers basically Mm -hmm. and grow in adult feathers um, a year from when when they fledged. And at that point they're mature and will start breeding. Okay. Are American kestrels a migratory bird? If so, what is their typical migration path and distance? Something cool about kestrels is some of them are migratory and some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. So uh, even in Boise, you'll see more males here during the winter Mm -hmm. time, which Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure why some people speculate it's because they're sticking around to protect their breeding territory, but the females typically go south. And then areas like Southern California, all the kestrels usually stay there. Um, But then in Canada, most all of them migrate south. So it really depends on where you are and uh, what your food base is during the winter. If there's no rodents around them, then the kestrels are going to leave. It is my understanding that the American kestrel are, and merlins are some of the smallest birds of prey and are similar in size. What are some of the features that one can use to help distinguish them in the wild? That's a good question. So once you learn them, they're actually really distinctive. Merlins are a little bigger than kestrels, mm-hmm. but it's not the size that I look for so much as the shape. They're a lot stockier. Mm-hmm. Um, So, I mean, their chest muscles are a lot more developed. They're kind of rounder. You see how the kestrel is kind of elongated. And then also merlins have a much shorter tail than kestrels. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you see a a falcon about this size, look for that tail. If it's real long and skinny and they're doing that bobbing motion Mm -hmm. that you see him do, which is how he got his name, by the way, um, then it's a kestrel. And if they're kind of like round and real muscly looking, then that's Mm -hmm. merlin. And that's because of their, their hunting styles. Like I said, kestrels just kind of swoop down and grab mm-hmm. rodents. They don't have to go super fast. But merlins, which are catching mm-hmm. birds often, um, they have to have real stocky chest mm-hmm. muscles to fly really fast to catch the birds. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today. I sure appreciate your time and for helping me to learn more about the American Kestrel so and the American Kestrel Partnership. Wonderful. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Armed with my newfound knowledge about ideal nest box locations, we searched the area around our backyards in both Sun Valley and Boise. Here are some of the potential nest box locations in Ketchum that we decided against. Ultimately, these locations pose challenges either due to issues of access because of the terrain or requiring permission. Okay, um, this is another one of our locations, and it is... 
meeting all the requirements except it is hard to check on and it's on forest service land so we would have to get a permit to put the nest box there also we would have to cut down some of the limbs to put a nest box up and during breeding season you have to check on it once every week and having that slope it would be hard to do that we chose this location because it is in our backyard and easy to access After choosing an aspen tree as our nest box location, we had to think of an innovative way to secure it in place. With a bit of ingenuity, we were able to rest the base of the nest box on the limb stump and secure the top with the bungee cord wrapped around the tree fastened by two eyelet bolts. Okay, um, I'm here at my house in Sun Valley. Um, in Hewlin Meadows and as you can see our nest box is up and it met the requirements of being eight feet above the ground in a non-wooded area with a big grassy expanse um, with good perches um, rodents and bugs. It was also up um, in mid-February which is when the males start coming in and it's also easy to check on since it's right near our back door. Hmm. Our backyard in Sun Valley borders the Sawtooth National Forest, and I am hopeful that this open space and perches will prove beneficial to the kestrels as they hunt near the nest. For the kestrel project, I decided to put up a nest box here in Boise and one up in Ketchum. The one in Boise is going to be put up around our back deck, which borders the Crane Creek Golf Course and the Crane Creek Drainage. The Crane Creek Drainage has been recognized by the National Audubon Society as a bird sanctuary because of a pair of resident red-tailed hawks and a great horned owl. The great horned owl may be a problem because it and kestrels are natural enemies and may compete for food. This is one of the pair of resident red-tailed hawks soaring over the Crane Creek drainage. Time will tell if it poses a threat to the kestrels choosing our nest box location. Hanging the nest box in Boise proved to be much easier since it only required using wood screws to secure the nest box into a post on the back edge of our property. As you can see, we have our final location for a nest box in Boise. In addition to the pair of resident red-tailed hawks and the great horned owl, the Crane Creek drainage attracts songbirds and woodpeckers to come and nest from all over. After putting up the nest box in Boise, we also discovered some owl pellets on the ground near the nest box location. So at this point in the project, I have researched nest box locations and with some help from my parents got them into place. Next, I will keep a careful watch for any nest box activity. If a nesting pair of kestrels chooses one of the boxes, I will observe and write down the data on my observation sheet of any successful breeding activity. In the future, I will be happy to give you some updates, but for now, this is Thomas Seaborn, citizen scientist for the Kestrel Partnership Project, signing off.